Amicus Curiae with host Daniel K. Wig, a podcast series from the New York County Lawyers Association. Join us monthly for candid, useful, inspirational, and entertaining conversations with leaders of the bench and bar and those who serve the legal profession. You are an accomplished attorney. You're a defense attorney. You've served as a prosecutor. You're a trial lawyer. That involves some knowledge of psychology, I think it's fair to say, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. What is it about the celebrity trials over the past so many years and what we're talking about today, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, that grabs the public's attention where they're riveted and they can't do anything else but watch the trial and talk about it with their friends? I think the psychology of it is is simple, which is that these people that were heroes have been brought back down to earth. And so when you look at it and you're like, wow, Johnny Depp, at one time, potentially the biggest movie star on the planet, his ugly nature has been brought out before the public. Unfortunately for Amber Heard, her (laughs) nature, her physical nature, as beautiful as it is, uh, has been undermined by the things that came out during this trial. So ultimately... You know, the jury came back in his favor, but really, and the media is not talking about this. It's a split verdict. She won a counterclaim against him and the amount of money that he won has been reduced. So basically eight and a half million is what, not even, but is what he's been awarded between compensatory and punitive damages. But really, I mean, he was seeking 50 and he was, you know, supposedly lost Pirates of the Caribbean, which I'm sure any the number of more movies, he would have had even more money than $50 million. So eight and a half million dollars, big deal, Johnny Depp. What did you really win? <laughs> okay. So I would like to welcome our listeners to Amicus Curie, Nyquist's podcast of casual, comfortable, and friendly conversations with leaders of the bench and bar and those who serve the legal profession. Listeners and guests will forgive me today as my voice is slightly hoarse, but hopefully we'll get through this episode. And I'm very happy and pleased to welcome Vinu Varghese to our podcast. Vinu is a visiting faculty member at Harvard Law School's Trial Advocacy Workshop. He is a member of the Forbes Business Council and the Entrepreneurs Organization. He has been included on the National Trial Lawyers Top 100 list for nine consecutive years. He has been named the Super Lawyer for the past eight years, and Martindale Hubble has rated him AV preeminent for five straight years. Earlier in his career, the New York Law Journal recognized him as a rising star. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Law Journal, and Law 360 have all quoted Venus multiple times for his vigorous advocacy of his clients. In addition, multiple newspapers have published his op-eds highlighting prosecutorial quandaries in the cases of O.J. Simpson, George Floyd, and the Central Park Karen. In an op-ed published on March 21st, 2020, Venus challenged then-Governor Cuomo's failure to include criminal defense attorneys as essential workers. The next day, criminal defense lawyers were deemed essential. Known as one of the nation's foremost white collar and criminal legal experts, Vino is a regular guest commentator on cable news networks ranging from Fox News to CNN and international networks from the BBC to Sky News Arabia. His expert status led Vanity Fair to have him fact-checked Hollywood scenes from the Wolf of Wall Street to billions. Vino graduated from Brooklyn Law School, my alma mater, New York University, and Chaminade High School. In 2000, Vino began his career as a prosecutor, and in 2006, he founded Varghese and Associates PC, a white-collar and criminal defense firm dedicated to helping clients across America resume their lives. And finally, as for the Nykla family, the host of this podcast, he was chair of the Solo and Small Firm Committee from 2007 to 2011. Vino, welcome today and thank you so much for sharing your expertise on what has riveted the nation for the past few weeks, the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial. Just uh, interrupt you for a second. I should have maybe done it at the beginning. It's Vinu, but it's close. You can call me V. That works. Okay. Yeah, whatever's easier for you. <laughs> so let's get sort of the, a little bit background on this particular case. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard had a short marriage, let's say it was uh, less than lovey-dovey, 
uh, we can call it tumultuous from what the news reports have reported and what Hollywood tabloids, et cetera. They divorced, obviously. And then back, I believe in 2016, first surfaced some allegations by Amber Heard that Johnny Depp was abusive. Can you share with us a little bit about what you know about those allegations? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, talk of Depp uh, hitting her. There were some photos introduced during the trial of her with a black eye. Her witness, though, was her makeup artist, which led to a little bit of concern of whether these photos were actually doctored or not. I think worse stuff came out about her. But getting back to Depp, part of it was his incessant drug use and his manners during the time that he was high. The sister of Amber Heard testified that she witnessed um, Johnny Depp hitting Amber Heard, her sister. So there was testimony, but really not that much. In fact, much of it was discredited. The sister, there was a text message from the sister that talked in a joking manner about, you know, alleged abuse by Johnny Depp, indicating that she really didn't think this was real or not serious, whatever it was, it basically undercut the sister's testimony because she was the only other witness to come forward to say that they had witnessed Johnny Depp hitting Hamburg Heard in any fashion. Was there ever any, in, in the divorce proceeding, was there ever any, I'll call it, and you'll correct me, any sort of judicial finding that Johnny Depp did anything improper, abusive to Amber Heard? No, I mean, the divorce was uh, apparently, and there was a joint statement that was made by the party saying, our relationship was intensely passionate and at times volatile, but always bound by love. And that came, uh, that was a statement, that was, a, you know, as I said, a joint statement that they settled their divorce. So there was no judicial finding from the divorce. So initially there was a temporary restraining order filed against him. In 2016, right? Yeah, there were statements made back and forth. And the judge did deny Heard's request that Depp attend a year's worth of anger management and refused to extend the protective order to the couple's dogs. So I guess there was some judicial findings, but not of any significance or anything that really helped Amber Heard. So to this particular case, this defamation case, isn't the first defamation case that that Johnny Depp uh, uh, was involved with. In fact, there was one uh, a couple years back where he um, sued the son, a British tabloid, for I believe referring to him as a wife beater. Tell us a little bit about that case and the outcome. The Depp in that there was a libel trial, uh, Depp sued the executive editor, Dan Wooten, and the son's parent company's news group newspapers. He had his ex-partner submit something, a statement that he's the furthest thing from a violent person. He at that time brought forth claims that Heard had had affairs with Elon Musk and James Franco. And that's when the stuff initially came out about Heard putting fecal matter in their bed, right? But in the end, the judge cited, I guess, judge was a bench trial that with the son. And, you know, the newspaper published a statement that said domestic abuse victims must never be silenced. And we thank the judge for his careful consideration and thank Amber Heard for her courage in giving evidence to the court. So that was a big loss for him. And what impact should that decision have had or did have on the present case? I think it should have had, as it did, little to no impact on this case because, you know, you're talking a different legal system. You're talking a bench trial. I mean, there's just too many different things in the way that that trial was handled to have a real impact on this case. The allegation here is that Amber Heard wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. And in there... And, and you can sort of fill in the blanks. She referred to herself as a victim of domestic abuse without, I believe, naming Johnny Depp specifically. Correct. And, so, and that's the basis of this particular case in a nutshell. And the fascinating, one of the first things when this case came out was I was wondering why this case was in Virginia. 
And why in state court? Why not in California where they both lived? And the basis for the jurisdiction was that the Washington Post servers were in that county, Fairfax County. So that was the basis for the jurisdiction of that courthouse. And I think it was certainly a shrewd move by his lawyers also to bring it there. I mean, creative, right? I mean, just to come up with the right court in an area that's predominantly, while it may have some blue leanings, certainly it's a DC suburb, but you're talking people with wealth and who are going to be possibly less biased against Johnny Depp than a California jury, depending on where in California you were, would be towards him. Interesting comment, blue leaning. So you're referring blue Democrat, the political color scheme. Why do you think that played a role in that? Well, you have to think about, you can just go back to the case or the clamor around Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings. Right. It was the basically the extreme left that were, you know, clamoring for him or, you know, to not be put on the Supreme Court on really what was very, very, I can tell you from a criminal point of view, absolutely zero credibility claims from, you know, his accuser. And it was a sham hearing. I mean, it it really was. Now, he didn't handle it very well. And the way that that, to, that left him to be abused by Matt Damon in that Saturday Night Live skit. I'm talking about because he likes beer, apparently. Right? right? Yeah, yeah, he loves beer. I mean, it was, and it wasn't really Matt Damon wasn't really acting very much in that thing. So Kavanaugh didn't handle it very well. But the actual allegation was, from my point of view, absolutely like garbage and ludicrous. I mean, um, to have the point at what it was to have that kind of thing. So, you know, I think it matters where you bring a case. And certainly, even though that was in D.C., I mean, really, that was not before a jury. That was political theater. You know, when you look at it, it was a great move by his lawyers to find an area where he would probably have a fairer trial being somebody who is going on the offense against somebody who claimed that he had committed acts of domestic violence against her. And this may sound like a silly question for a podcast hosted by a bar association, but I'll ask anyway. So what would Depp have to prove that Amber Heard defamed him with sort of the elements of this cause of action, at least in the Virginia court? Yeah. So first, I'll just read for the easiest thing, is to read from the jury instructions, which are available on the Fairfax County uh, website. That, you know, she made statements that were in the Washington Post, for example. I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protected men accused of abuse. That's a direct quote from her thing. So she had obviously made or published that statement. The next thing they had to show that the statement was about Mr. Depp, right? And three, I mean, I think it went without saying that the statement was clearly about Johnny Depp. But three, the question is, was the statement false? And clearly the jury believed the statement was false. And that the statement next, the statement had a defamatory implication about him. Jury believed that. I mean, he won on all three defamation counts. That it was designed and intended by her. Yes, it was, right? And it conveyed a defamatory implication to someone who saw it other than Mr. Depp. Yes. Then it took, and this is where this was a huge victory, at least legally, for him, which was that those first six elements, I didn't read all of them, but those elements were by a preponderance of the evidence standard, meaning, you know, that more likely than not that this is true. Then she had to prove by a higher standard of proof that the statement was made with actual malice. These are the same instructions for all three counts of defamation, and he prevailed on all of those. Okay, so that's what he had to prove now. And I forget if you mentioned this since we've been recording the show, or if this is when you and I spoke separately. What doesn't get a lot of attention, as you pointed out, is that Heard had a counterclaim that she prevailed on. What was her counterclaim in this case? She had filed three counterclaims, and they are listed on the Fairfax County website, the jury instructions. They were called F G. And H, and that's just in terms of the jury instructions. She lost on two of them, but she prevailed on one, and that was the the one called G. And in that, 
She had to prove by a greater weight of the evidence that Adam Waldman, while acting as an agent for Mr. Depp, made or published the following statement. Quote, quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempt didn't do the trick. The officers came to the penthouses, thoroughly searched and interviewed, and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine and roughed the place up, got their story straight under the direction of a lawyer and publicist, and then placed a second call to 911. End quote. So she had to prove the statement was about her, which obviously she's mentioned in the statement. It was seen by someone other than Miss Heard, which it was since it was publicly made by one of Johnny Depp's reps and that the statement is false. So, wow, she prevailed on that. Okay. Then again, the same standard of proof, clear and convincing evidence, a significantly higher standard of proof that the statement made by Mr. Waldman was made with actual malice. So, she prevailed on one of her three counterclaims and got $2 million on that. He got $10 million in compensatory damages, got $5 million per the jury, but per Virginia statute is capped out at over $300,000. So he got, you know, $10 million plus, you know, he didn't get, he only got $10 million plus three hundred minus $2 million. <laughs> so he got just under $8.5 million, which for him what is that, half a day of pay for Pirates of the Caribbean? You know, I mean, like, not much. And you got to think his lawyers were the real winners in this case, right? As were Amber Heard's lawyers. I assume, I have to believe, I should assume, but I have to believe that they made more than $10 million on, on this case. So really, what did Johnny Depp recoup? Not much. And, you know, Amber Heard is going to be challenging this, apparently. You know, we could talk about that her chances on appeal when, when you want to. Yeah, let's talk about the trial a little bit now. Sure. It became, to some extent, theater for some people. First impression I'd like to get from you, everyone that I spoke with, lawyer and non-lawyer alike, who watched this thing religiously, I did not, no offense to, to anyone covering it. They all sided with Johnny Depp. I don't know anyone who, personally anyone I'm sure there are who sided with Amber Heard. What are your thoughts on, forget about the legal arguments, forget about necessarily the, you know, the strength of witnesses and, and uh, you know, with the perceived veracity of the witnesses, the persona, the Johnny Depp persona, the winking, the nodding, the laughing, which she did. Amber Heard, there's a lot of emojis out there where she's like compared to a Muppet, where she's crying and they always capture her being upset. What good or bad you think that that did for either side. I think she was poorly prepared for this case because there were times that while on the stand, put aside what's out on social media, because, you know, put that aside, just in how she came across at times on the stand was not good. I mean, she was a trained witness, but not properly trained. And so, for example, she was speaking She'd look at the questioner when asked the question and turn to the jury to answer the question. She should not have done that because remember, she's a civilian witness. She's not a cop. She's not an FBI agent. She's not an expert. Experts are trained to do that. So later on in the trial, her expert, a psychiatrist, came forward and testified on her behalf and was fantastic. I mean, I actually was covering this for Fox Nation, and I was on twice in the last two weeks during their lunch hour where it was one hour straight of speaking with the host, going through what had happened on those days' events, as well as the trial overall. And I just happened to be there on the day the psychiatrist, Dr. Steuben, testified on Heard's behalf, and he was terrific. He kicked the lawyer on the other side, <laughs> the main lawyer, not Vasquez. He, he destroyed him. During that day, and I actually thought Amber Heard at that point had a chance to prevail. And look, she prevailed on one of her three claims. So I think ultimately he didn't really win. I mean, I'm sure he spent well in excess of fifty million dollars between his his legal team, his his PR team. I mean, clearly he had the PR machine working better in his favor than she did. So do I think he won the trial? Yes, I think that. She hurt herself during the trial. 
He had more things. So I, her, her lawyers, I thought, did a terrible job. She picked the wrong lawyers. And, you know, while, you know, you sit here, you're like, oh, how can you criticize other lawyers? I can criticize other lawyers. Because, <laughs> That's why we have you on this show. Right. Because I've tried over 40 cases myself. And, you know, when I see lawyers that are on TV, I look at them and, and a lot of times they make me cringe. And I will say that with the exception of that last day with the psychiatrist, Dr. Steuben, really destroying... Johnny Depp's main lawyer, the rest of the trial that I observed, Johnny Depp's lawyers were head and shoulders better than Amber Heard's lawyers. Johnny Depp's lawyers were just way better. And so when you have that kind of advantage in court, you know, it usually translates into a victory. And it did. I mean, and, and Vasquez did a you know, what a, a really good job on Amber Heard. As I said, she was prepared, just not properly. And she did not come across in a sympathetic manner that would evoke emotions or change the the tenor of the case. Drilling down a little bit more on Ms. Heard's psychologist, what was it, if you can, you know, highlight a few things that, you know, made you just say that he sort of eviscerated one of Mr. Depp's lawyers. And what was it that he said or testified to that made you at that point think maybe she's got a chance to win? Because he debunked any idea that Johnny Depp was a decent human being. So Depp was portrayed as like, as you you just spoke a couple of minutes ago about this kind of like nice guy, you know, friendly persona and stuff. And what he did was basically call him a narcissist, right? And an abuser. And he spoke about, and he tied it together really well, that he spoke about the intoxication constant or the, you know, Johnny Depp being high. And that leads people that are not good people, you know, to do things that they would otherwise normally do. But the key point was that Depp wasn't a good person to begin with. He called him a narcissist, right? And then the attorney for, I, I think it was Chu, he was the lead guy. He did nothing to stop this guy. You know, as, as you mentioned, you know, I teach trial skills to Harvard law students. And I was just amazed and not in a positive way, in a negative way of how poorly at that moment, Johnny Depp's lead counsel did with this witness, because he let Dr. Steuben, who is a highly credentialed individual, just dominate him and just get in everything. I mean, Steuben was mocking him. Steuben was mocking this tri the trial. And I thought, you know what? This is the first time that there's been like a movement, any sort of potential swinging of the pendulum. And you knew that his testimony had hit home because you saw him being vilified on social media, right? And they were like all these people putting out things. I mean, it was incredible to watch this guy being attacked. Why? Because he was effective, right? Because clearly Johnny Depp's people in their PR campaign, it was suggested that there may have been bots and everything that he had instilled to dominate social media. Whether that's true or not, the fact is that these were not bots responding to Dr. Steuben's testimony because they were upset. Justice for Johnny, right? I mean, it was the it was the the trending hashtag, all of which I have no problem with. But this psychiatrist and the guy tried to get him like, oh, it's improper for you to to talk about it. You're a you're a member of the American Psychiatric Association. There's this Goldwater rule that says that you know you're not supposed to comment on people that you haven't actually evaluated. And of course, he actually did not have the ability because Johnny Depp's team refused to evaluate Johnny Depp and do a full thing on him, which obviously made sense. You're not going to allow your guy to be evaluated by the opposing person's uh, psychiatrist. But what he said was, and this, this exchange was really intense, between him and the lawyer with Dr. Steuben just dominating him, was like, isn't it improper? You're a fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. He's like, if what you're saying is true, then no expert could ever testify in any trial, right? And he just, I mean, there was just one thing after another. Like the guy was just shocking. And this was the first time you saw Johnny Depp react 
he took off his sunglasses and tried to stare down the doctor. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't intimidate this guy. And you saw everybody at Depp's place. It was the first time they didn't have a poker face in any sense. Like, or they were just shaking their heads, shaking their heads. So to the extent that she won one of her counterclaims, I think this guy had a big part in winning. It's a little bit interesting because... I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that while you know the Depp PR machine went into overdrive, and, and clearly you know he tried to come across with the jokes and the laughing, et cetera, there is a history, I think, of Depp acting less than nice, if I can say that. You know, does that sort of show a lack of preparation on the attorney's part? That hey, look, this is going to come out, and how do we address it? Or were they so consumed with the PR machine thinking that they wanted on that end that they didn't sort of anticipate what the doctor would do? It's not that they denied, I mean, they denied any abuse, but they didn't deny his bad behavior to the extent that he would get high, right? But they said that he was a nice guy when he was high and all that stuff. And what the doctor did, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, was tie the fact of getting high to abusive behavior and that it increased the chances of being more abusive, especially when you have, when you look at Johnny Depp and you see that he's a narcissist, right? So one of the questions that the Fox News host asked me was, do you think this expert, you know, went over the heads of the jury? I said, quite the opposite, because everybody knows a narcissist, right? That's, that's a term that's no longer a scientific term. We just know that narcissists are not good people. Right. And there was a joke back and forth. The host, the female host was like, yeah, I dated a few in my time. Right. (laughs) It was kind of of a funny exchange. And the the other co-panelists were joking around. Yeah. So we all. Right. So like everybody knows what a narcissist is. And then they know about being an abuser. Right. So everyone knows somebody, you know, whether it's an uncle or parent who, you know, maybe, you know, may have a heavy hand. So what this doctor did was tie that in the end. But ultimately, look, she didn't win on that, right? And ultimately, they believed that her statements were false. They were about Johnny Depp and that they were false. So, but to the extent that she won anything, I think it was sort of a compromise. And I think he was a big factor in her getting anything. You've touched already upon the lawyers on both sides. And I want to drill down a little bit there. First question Do you think that when a lawyer is doing a trial like this, that's being televised, what impact does it have on them and their and their performance? And when I say performance, I don't mean acting. I mean your performance in doing your job, your job performance as an advocate for your client. Well, I think, you know, people will will tend to be more bombastic if they've had a trial being recorded. And to that extent, I think Depp's lawyers overall, with the exception of that testimony by Dr. Steuben, did a really good job. They did not appear that they were pandering for television. The flip side of that was that Amber Heard's lawyers looked like they didn't belong in any courtroom, (laughs) you know, to TV or not. And that was the problem. I mean, her lawyers were just outlawed. I mean, they were beaten. I mean, they were just, Depp's lawyers were just better overall. Just just much better. If you represented Amanda Heard, how different do you think? And I, I know you're going to tell me you would have been very different, but tell me what you would have done differently. Well, start with her, right? You've got to generate feelings for her, right? And I thought that her mannerisms were just quirky. The meme on social media, the, one of the prevailing memes was that she was turning it on and off with tears and things you know, along those lines. And, and the reality was, it was kind of, it was fairly accurate, those memes. But those memes were, were fairly accurate because she didn't seem genuine. And so you've got to work on somebody. Look, she's an actress. You can work with her, right? She's got the skills to evoke sympathy. So she wasn't an empathetic figure during this trial. And the fact that she was talking directly to the jury. Well, if she is a victim, right? And I have great problems with the term victim. Our work at our firm is primarily white collar, about 70 plus percent white collar. The other 30% is representing men who are charged with 
domestic violence, you know, white collar males charged with domestic violence and or sex crimes, right? So the term victim is used like routinely by by prosecutors and judges. When I step into a courtroom and this is on a criminal case, I will not allow the term victim to be used. I will protest. I will file motions to prevent the prosecution or the court from referring to a person as a victim. You can call them an alleged victim. You can call them, I seek to have them call what they are, which is a complainant. In this situation, if she's the victim, right, which is what you want, you're representing Amber Heard. You want to portray her as the victim. If she's been a victim of domestic violence, she shouldn't be talking to the jury directly. She should be looking straight at the questioner the entire time, right? She's not an expert who has been trained in how to testify, like Dr. Steuben, like any expert witness, like a law enforcement official, right? They're trained. So they look at the questioner when they're asked a question, then they talk to the jury, right? The FBI in particular, agents go through this training during Quantico, during the camp. But in her position, she started looking like a professional witness and it didn't help her because she should have just been keeping the same demeanor and persona. And at times she turned it on and off, you know, and she got very combative with Vasquez. So Vasquez is credited as, you know, having destroyed Amber Heard. There's a witness rule that I give witnesses when they're testifying, which is the nastier the questioner gets, which is in my case, the prosecutor, the nicer you get. Amber Heard did not react nicely, did not react as a victim. She was, got angry at times and was flustered by Vasquez. So Vasquez did a good job, but I, I think Amber Heard was just poorly trained to handle the questioning that she was going to get. So look, she was undone in, in you know, a large part by her lawyers. I think she could have won this case. Clearly she won one of her three counterclaims. So you know, she could have, if she had been prepared better, came across as more of an empathetic figure who could evoke sympathy on the part of the jurors. She may have prevailed, but, you know, with what was presented before the jury, I do not at all fault them for the way they came back. So let's talk about the witnesses. I mean, you mentioned the doctor on Amber Heard's side, and you thought he was a good witness and may have been a turning point. Obviously, he wasn't. Talk to us a little bit about Johnny Depp's witnesses and your thoughts on the case that they presented. I think one of the central witnesses for him was Kate Moss, who basically- His former girlfriend. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, supermodel, whatever, and and testified that, you know, he wasn't abusive. Now that was countered by Ellen Barkin, who, you know, testified that, you know, Depp had thrown a bottle at her in a hotel room. So, you know, you had these back and forth sort of conflicting witnesses, you know, and then he had a bunch of his like buddies, <laughs> some of them. I, I wasn't sure, to be honest with you, as I was watching this trial. I mean, I knew on which side they were being called, but I wasn't sure who side some of these people were testifying on behalf of. You didn't know like what good they did for client. Now I knew that some witnesses were called by Depp. Obviously I knew the order as I was watching it, you know, for Fox, but it was sort of like, huh, why did you call this witness? Did it help you? I mean, it just looked like Depp was just, you know, either high or stoned or whatever it was, you know, and nobody really swung the pendulum one way or another. And I think ultimately it was all useless because Depp came across far more likable. I mean, he destroyed Amber Heard's lawyers when he testified because they didn't control the witness. And that's again, when I teach at Harvard, I tell you, you've got to control your witness. Do not let your witness talk on and on. And every time that he made a silly statement, you know, mocking the lawyers like, hey, you know, that day you were really, you know, drunk. Oh, you were there? You know, like this kind of like you know, things, you know, judge move to strike. Get the judge to control Johnny Depp. They did a terrible job. So I think when it came down, all it came down to really was the testimony of Depp versus the testimony of Heard, And he was far better than her. Do you credit acting skills with it? I don't know if he was acting. <laughs> I just think he was... 
being himself. I mean, which is like, he's a mess, you know, he's a mess. <laughs> and you think the jury got it right based upon everything you saw? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And I, it appears by the, the decision that this was a manufactured or an op-ed designed to increase her status and it didn't, it didn't work. Ultimately, I don't think they gave her, the jury had awarded him $5 million in punitive damages. Again, these numbers, if she acted with actual malice in publishing this op-ed and it destroyed his career, the jury basically came back with $10 million on compensatory damages. Well, are you saying that that was the amount? That's all that hurt him was $10 million? Weren't some of his contracts like $20 million and things along, along those lines? So not that big a deal. And if you're saying that she acted, which they found on all three of his you know, claims against her, that she acted with actual malice, you're only going to award $5 million? I mean, that's – and you've supposedly ruined this guy's career? Clearly, the jury, even with those numbers, didn't really think he was hurt that much by her or even her malicious nature. Eh, so what? <laughs> what was the allegations strike that? What did Depp say? Uh, That's what the lawyer should have been saying every time Johnny Depp went off. Strike that <laughs> judge, Ruth, strike. Control you when it's judge. I'm going to ask for an instruction. To the crew that when Johnny Depp doesn't answer the question, the jury is to disregard and and to admonish Mr. Depp because we can't continue this cross-examination if he's going to keep making statements and not taking this case seriously. How was he hurt? What were the allegations of how his career was hurt by the alleged abuse that Amber Heard wrote about? Well, he said that he lost all his contracts, right? He was the... Uh, the Pirates movies. The Pirates, the uh, the other Grinnenwald or whatever it was, you know, that he lost all his contracts. Now, there was a Disney official who testified that it had nothing to do with it. I mean, that his, you know, boorish behavior on set is what caused them to cancel jo uh, Johnny Depp, not this op-ed, but who knows. And Amber Heard, did she have any allegations that her career was hurt by any of, by, you know, anything dealing with Johnny Depp? The answer is yes, uh, but... The fact is that, you know, she's, there was this online petition about having her go, you know, get off of Aquaman, but, you know, she's still an Aquaman, I believe in the next movie. And I'm looking forward to seeing her in Aquaman. I'm a big fan of her as an Aquaman. Yeah. <laughs> I love Aquaman. I love her, in, you know, in Aquaman regalia, you know, so. <laughs> you started touching upon this earlier. Herd's lawyer is using the word appeal. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. So, so you may have just answered the question succinctly, but I'll ask you anyway. So what is their basis as far as you know for appeal? And what do you think the likelihood is that they'll have any success? What they have said is that the actress will quote unquote, absolutely want to appeal. They have excellent grounds for it. She blamed some of the evidentiary decisions and the fact and some of the influence social media had on the proceedings. You know, I, I, I don't think that they're going to have any Based on what was done during the trial, I, I think that they're, you know, fine to the extent that the judge, I mean, Depp is going to be fine to the extent that the judge committed some errors on evidentiary rulings. It's very difficult to get a, a case reversed based on evident, bad, poor evidentiary decisions. And then when you compound that with a terrible lawyering on Amber Heard's side, you know, good luck, Amber, on that, if you're actually going to go, go through an appeal. So I like to wrap up our conversation with a little bit about you and, and your career. I'm going to paraphrase a question from the movie, The Devil's Advocate. We sometimes quote movies or paraphrase movies on this podcast. So if you're familiar with the movie, I am the Al Pacino character is interviewing the Keanu Reeves character for a position of the firm. And the Keanu Reeves character at the time was, I think, a solo defense attorney who had been a prosecutor. And the question was along the lines is, how do you go from locking them up to defending them? So you are a former prosecutor who is on the defense side now. How do you make the transition from prosecutor to defense? Well, I, I will tell you that for me, I wasn't sure I'd be able to do that. I saw The Devil's Advocate in law school when it came out. So I, I'm, I'm aging myself. You can look up when <laughs> The Devil's Advocate came out. I was in law school. And I remember I went to go see it with my girlfriend at the time, who's an absolutely loving, great woman. And she started like crying during that movie. 
And she's like, that's going to be you one day. <laughs> Not in any negative <laughs> sort of way, but she knew that I was going to be a prosecutor. And, and uh, you know, at the time I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor and I was going to head that way. And I didn't think I'd ever be, you know, a defense lawyer. But, you know, in, in my first year as a prosecutor in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn DA's office, and I had gotten a taste of it. I had interned at the U.S. Attorney's Office for a full year in law school, got to work on some stuff, did a lot of writing. And, you know, I had a overall really good experience in terms of trying cases, investigating cases and appeals at the Brooklyn DA's office. But I remember, you know, you learn very quickly when you're a prosecutor in Brooklyn, at least back then in the early 2000s, that there was a thin line between good and evil. Right. So a defendant one day could be your complainant the other day, the next day, and vice versa. So I remember prosecuting a case where the complainant was being prosecuted while he was a complainant, a victim. And I'll use the term victims because he was. Uh, ultimately, a jury determined that he was a victim of a crime, of a gang attack. He was simultaneously being prosecuted by my office for a sex crime. And in that sex crime, was the basis for the reason why he was beaten up. So he allegedly, you know, committed a sex crime on the sister of a Latin king. So, and that's why they beat him up because he was a Latin king. So you can see that everything is interwoven. There was like a very thin line who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. And I realized ultimately, you know what? The questions of morality are left to God in your individual conscience, right? I have a job to do as a defense lawyer, and I relish in that job. I relish in, in making the government prove their case. You know, most defense lawyers, most of my practice is federal. I came out of state court system, but 70% of my work is federal. And the federal defense bar is a snitch bar, right? Like everybody runs to cooperate their clients because that's the system in the federal thing. I don't, right? We rarely, I'm not saying I've never done it, but it's been rare in my 16, oh, going on 17 years as a criminal defense attorney that I've represented a snitch or a cooperator. <laughs> See, the prosecutors hate the word snitch, you know? It's not what we do. And I think it's bad lawyering overall because there's a rush by these former federal prosecutors because that's all they know, right? They All they know is, oh, you got to cooperate. So when they become defense lawyers, they're just basically not acting differently than they were when they were prosecutors. And they're not putting the government to the proof. And we do. And I think that's the difference. I mean, like I always took my job as a prosecutor very seriously. And my one goal as a prosecutor was to make sure that no innocent man goes to jail on my watch. The reality is most of America doesn't care if an innocent man goes to jail, no matter what you hear in the paper. Because they would, you know, there's an adage that you learn in law school that it's better that 10 guilty men go free, then one innocent man go to jail. I don't think most Americans believe that. I think you'd rather have eh, one innocent man go to jail. That's the cost of making sure 10 guilty people go to jail, right? I think that's overall what most people agree. And I, I think that, you know, believe, and I think that's a real problem. And I think as a defense lawyer, you know, we are the last stand against the government, you know, and, and the government going too far. And so, going up from locking them up to uh, defending them in court. Not hard if you believe in your role in the system, which is to do the right thing, whether you're on the prosecution side or on the defense side. Where can people find you? Social media, webpage? Just, yeah, Google me. I'm all over. We have a webpage, uh, VargiseLaw.com, V-A-R-G-H-E-S-E-L-A-W.com. You can just Google me. You'll see all of our social media. We have Instagram, YouTube, our marketing people. I have a marketing team to get out there because I do a lot of television. Because I do a lot of television and I do a lot of interviews, You know, my marketing team cuts that up and puts that on social media. So we're on every platform that you can uh, imagine. So I think that's out there that I'm aware of. <laughs> Great. So thank you very much for joining us, for sharing your great insight into this trial that has captivated so many people. And we'll see where it goes on appeal. So thank you again. I am Dan Wick, your host. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in to Amicus Curie, Michael's podcast of casual, comfortable, and friendly conversations with leaders of the bench and bar and those who serve the legal profession. And that is a wrap. 
Thank you for listening to NYCLA Amicus Curiae Candidly Speaking with host Daniel K. Wig, a podcast from the New York County Lawyers Association. New and previous episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Android, Stitcher, and Spotify. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share, rate, and leave a review on your listening platform. To find out more or to join our incredible inclusive legal community, please visit NYCLA.org. We hope you'll join us on the next monthly installment of NYCLA Amicus Curiae Candidly Speaking. Be sure to follow our Twitter feed at Amicus NYCLA for information on upcoming episodes.